Hey, it's Michael, and this is the Kintsugi Podcast. I'll be back in a minute with this week's conversation about resilience. But first, if you wish to create a better life and have a better career, then please visit michaelobrienshift.com and download your free workbook on how to create a better life. In it, you'll discover ways to find more energy for the things and the people who matter most to you so you can create a better tomorrow. Hey there, it's Michael, and welcome back, or welcome to the Kintsugi Podcast. It's time for another conversation about resilience, and today's conversation is a gem. When I first met Deandra Harmony, I fell in love with her voice. That was my first introduction to her, and I know you will as well. There's something so soothing about her voice. There's something just soothing about her energy. She's one of those incredible humans looking to be better humans to other humans, to paraphrase Austin Channing Brown. She's a wonderful coach. But her story, her story is so resilient. She's a survivor. She has fallen down a few times, like we all have. If we're living and we're playing in traffic, we will get knocked down. But Deandra has always found a way to get back up again, to make a difference, to have faith that she has a bigger purpose out there, that the things that are happening in her life are happening for her, not to her. I just loved our conversation. I know you will love it as well. But most importantly, you will fall in love with Deandra. She's the type of person that you need to have in your Peloton in some form or fashion. And I know you'll feel the same way once you get done listening to our conversation. So I met Deandra through the Clubhouse app, which I've referenced a few times here on the Kintsugi podcast. If you're not part of the community, I definitely recommend that you join because you get to meet fantastic humans like Deandra on the app. And there's something different about the app that Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn just don't have. It's a different type of energy. Maybe it's because you only hear someone's voice. So you can be fully present. There's nothing else to really judge. You can be in that conversation. So that's my Clubhouse commercial for you. But the most important thing about this episode is what Deandra is about to share with you. So sit back, Grab your coffee or tea and enjoy our conversation. And I'll be back to talk about next week's conversation about resilience here in a few. Hey, Dee, good to see you. Hi, Michael. Such a pleasure to be with you. And this is something I've been looking forward to all week. I can't wait to get into it with you and, and share your story with so many people and just share how you personally and then how you help other women get through like those tough moments in life that we all have, build that resilience, build that Kintsugi spirit. So we'll start here as we do with every episode, every conversation about resilience. So how would you define resilience? Oh, you know, it's one of those words, I think it's unique to everyone and how we look at it. But at the core, I think we all can agree. It's getting knocked down and then getting back up, right? It's just, it comes down to, expectations I've found. Um, the more, the higher my expectations are for something, the bigger the opportunity it is for me to fall down flat on my face, right? But then the bigger the opportunity to pick myself back up. And when I pick back up, um, when I get back up, I see things differently than I did before. It's kind of like a, a deck of cards that you just throw up in the air, right? They're all still there. All of the, the cards are there. But now we got to reshuffle them. And sometimes that's what we need to do in order to be resilient and, and figure out a new way forward instead of just continuing to beat our head against a brick wall with whatever we were encountering at the time. I love that. So what that speaks to is wisdom, like the learning agility. So it's there's the old ad- adage, like, fall down seven, get back up eight. And that's I'm right. like, but if we're not learning why we fell down in the first place, mm-hmm. if we don't open up our aperture and have more awareness, mm-hmm. then we're almost deemed to fall down in the same way again. So I love your definition. It's like, okay, we're going to fall down. If we're going to live life in traffic, as I like to say, and we're in it, we're going to have moments, we're going to fall down. But when we get back up, let's learn something from the experience and wisdom. So we, we head in maybe a slightly different direction. 
Exactly. And you know what? It's either going to be wisdom that we learn from or baggage that we carry yeah. with us. It's yeah. one or the other, right? We we never really start again from the exact same place. We don't start from square one. We start now from whatever it is we experienced that got us up to that point. And so now we either have a story with us that we're going to carry forward into our future and it's going to impact the way we see the world, or we're going to have that wisdom, which is ultimately still just a story. It's just a, a story that's useful and beneficial for us. You know, that to me is what wisdom is, is being able to look at a situation, filter it and synth synthesize it through our experiences, and then be able to say, all right, what is the best thing for me right now? What is the need, the thing that I need more than anything in this moment? But if we're not willing to do that, we'll take that same creative energy and turn it into bitterness. And, and then we'll say things like this. See, I knew this was going to happen. It was only a matter of time. And this always happens to me. I'm always the guy that ends up with this or I'm always the girl, you know, whatever. So that's what I have found. Life comes down to whatever stories you're going to tell yourself. Those become true for you. And no one else gets to override that for you. That is your free will. I love that. Yeah, it's the conversation that we have with ourselves. You know, conversation, conversation makes everything happen. But the conversation that we don't spend enough time really thinking about is the one that we're having with ourselves. And we're having that multiple times a day. And it tends to be quite harsh. Yes, very much. And then especially if you have a partner in your life that you are um, you have some history there with of, of certain things. And we all do, right? Everyone in a relationship, we, there are things that we just know, if I say this, <laughs> everything's going to blow up, right? We know that. So we're, we're coming from that perspective too with our partner sometimes, which gets very difficult because our partner may be in La La Land, just, you know, enjoying their life and they make one comment. And the next thing you know, boom, everything has, has, gone to hell in a handbasket because of whatever dialogue you had going on within yourself. So this is how it sounds. This is the language. Um, what is that supposed to mean? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's what like, you, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then all of a sudden you're in like an argument and then halfway through, you're like, what are we fighting? What are we about fighting again? about? Exactly. Yeah. We don't even and know what we're fighting about we sometimes don't. when we fight. I call that an argument invitation and I don't have to attend every argument I'm invited to. I just don't. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So often though, we, we feel like we, we need to, we got to have a moment just to like, let it be just like relax. So what I'd love for you to share your story with our audience, because you have, you've done some wonderful things, but you've also had to play in traffic. And a lot. All that good stuff like that. So tell us a little bit about your story. Man, there's so much to tell. Um, and honestly, I I tend to tell everyone. I feel like I've already lived a hundred lives at least in, in this one life. Um, but I'll try and put it in a nutshell as, as much as possible. I was born into poverty and I was born to um, a young mom who already had two kids. She was 27 by the time she had me. My father had recently returned from the military. He was also 27. And um, his mental illness was triggered with schizophrenia while he was there. So he began self-medicating and, and thus my life became a series of dysfunctional parent or being raised in a dysfunctional home. Um, as he struggled with drugs and alcohol addiction, and it affected my mom, it affected our whole family, of course. Everyone who's been in that situation knows it's not just the addict who's affected. Fast forward to that, my parents divorced, and my mom married a very abusive man who ultimately did sexually abuse me. So at that point, I was 14, almost 15 years old, and asked to leave my home because, uh, according to my mom, her husband was simply sick and needed help. And so I had to leave. So I've been on my own since I was 14 years old. I didn't know any different though. And what's, what's interesting is when, when I tell this story, even telling it right now, it's almost like looking back at a movie of my life because it feels like it was so long ago, but I know it, it, that is the beginning of where I am today, right? Those were my humble beginnings. And so I ended up working my tail off, getting into a very good school. I got into Carnegie Mellon and um, 
And I saw that as an avenue to have a better life. However, while I was there, my grandmother became very ill. She was diagnosed with COPD, so I had to come home and help my mom care for my grandma. I never made it back to Carnegie Mellon. So during that time, this was in like late 90s, um, and shortly after that, I ended up meeting the future father of my children. We got married, and we were married for 14 years. We have two beautiful children together. Um, but we did divorce and for a while I, I was really lost with that divorce. I felt like, first of all, I got married at 22. What in the world did I know about marriage? I didn't even know who I was at 22. It seems pretty young right now. It like my, so my oldest young. is 23 and I'm like, no way. Right. Yeah. You know, like well, I got married <laughs> a few, just a few years later, like 20, you know, like in my mid twenties, I'm like, God, that seems so young. But, it seems you know. so young. Yeah. And I went through this whole period of getting angry at my parents and his parents because I'm like, you guys knew we didn't know what we were getting into. Why would you let us do that? And and their response was um, very illuminating. They said, D, you were going to do what you wanted to do no matter what we said. So there was no point. We just wanted to be in your life and be a part of it. And I think just that alone is wisdom and insight from, you know, adults looking at younger people saying, hey, this is your life to live. This is your life to figure out. It's your life to screw up or, or make amazing. Whatever you're going to do, it's up to you. So I do give them credit for that. But I was single for uh, just a little while, just about a year, and ended up um, then meeting a man who very much reminded me of all the dysfunction of home, which is typically what we do. Um, we find that person who brings out all those feelings that we experience that make made it feel like home. So he was struggling with alcoholism himself. And of course, as a codependent caretaker, I'm like, I can save you and yes, I understand yes. you and all this stuff. And I am the Shiro yes, to your challenge. Yes. yes, you know, and and for a long time, um, like I think a lot of people do, I blamed him for the situation that I was in in my life. I didn't seem like I could get ahead because I'm constantly, you know, dragging him. But the truth of the matter is there was a payoff to that relationship, just like there is to every dependent and codependent and, and every caretaker and narcissist. And it just is. What was I getting? I was getting the sense of feeling like I was rescuing someone and that made me feel needed. And it took a long time to even recognize that, right? Most of us don't think about that. I got to put him in my prison of love, which is what codependency is. It comes from good intentions. But really, it says, hey, I want to keep you safe, quote unquote, which really means let me control you so that you don't mess up your life because yes. I know what's best for you. And what it's really saying is I don't want to experience pain. I don't want to experience this hurt and loss from you not fulfilling your potential. So let me try to fix it. It, it all comes from a place of love and, and good intention. But my grandmother used to always say the path to hell to, is laid with good intentions. Yes, right? it is. Yep. And so I, it just, and ultimately putting someone in a, a prison um, of, of your own love is hell for that person and for you, because it means you can't ever change and they can't ever change and life can never change. Circumstances can never change. And then I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's right? the changing of, it's the, if all this will hap happen, my happiness is on the other side of all these different events. Sort of in exactly. the spirit of we're chasing our happiness. We're chasing and then, our happiness. And then we mm -hmm. catch it. We, we do catch it from time to time. We have moments where we're like, oh, this feels good. But the structural support system for our happiness isn't there. It's not right. core, right? right? So then right. it flies away again. And then we go mm -hmm. back to chasing it. Exactly. And it's external. And so, you know what? I tell people all the time when I'm working with someone who is new to really this concept of overcoming codependency, um, I listen to them and they'll say things like, oh, you know what? If my boss was just more um, supportive of advancing my career, or if my husband was more supportive, or if my parents had set me up for success and all this stuff, and, and if they would just do this, if my kids were more sufficient or whatever. And I say to them, okay, so all these people need to change. Let's say they all made those changes that you want. Then what? And the, the answer is, of course, then I'll be happy. Well, then what happens if they don't? Well, then I'll be miserable. 
Well, here lies the problem. You don't have an internal locus of control. You don't have your own sense of power because you've given it away, but you're blaming the very people that you've given your power to. And all that has to happen in order for you to reclaim that power is learn how to love yourself and set your own boundaries. This is what works for me. This is what feels good for me. But in order to do that, you have to pay attention to how you feel. And yeah. codependents have a hard time with that. Um, we are much more focused on how other people are feeling. So for many years, um, I struggled with that. And I had this sense of, I don't want to, um, I don't want to fail again, is what I thought. With marriage number two, I didn't want to fail again. And I went through this whole process of trying to figure out a way to make it work without compromising my whole life. But I realized that wasn't an option. Um, when you're with someone who's self-destructive, it's only a matter of time before you get taken down too. And you, you can't save people. You can only love them. That's it. So um, going through the process of realizing that my marriage was an illusion, and I don't blame him because the truth is he wanted to be healthy and whole as much as I wanted him to be healthy and whole. It just was not going to happen. So my pandemics of sorts started on December 31st, New Year's Eve, 2018, when I filed for divorce because I realized I can either get out of this after these last five years or I can keep reliving the same year for another 20, 30 years and call it a life. And I wasn't willing to do that. So I filed for divorce. Um, three weeks later, I started a new job, a very visible job with the um, Innovative Healthcare Organization. A couple months after that, I sold or I left the house we were in together, bought a new house for me and my children, renovated the home, put them in new schools that came with the, their own set of challenges, and they were middle schoolers. So it's a lot. Um, That's high school a lot. Stuff, That's a middle hard school age stuff. to switch schools at. Yes, so. yes, very much. Um, but they wanted to, and and I was like, all right, we're just going to have a fresh start, you guys. We're going to have a fresh start. So they started school um, in early August, and I finalized my divorce on um, August 9th. And at the time, he had gone through rehab and was doing everything he could to save the marriage. Um, to his credit, he did try very hard, but it um, it wasn't going to change. So I filed for divorce on August 9th, and then on August 22nd, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So with all of that happening all at once, the tumor that was growing, my doctor told me, was so large, it had probably cropped up in the, in the previous six weeks, is what she said. And she wow. wanted to know what's been going on in your life over the last three to six months. I'm like, how much time do you have? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, wow. So she didn't come out and directly say that I manifested it. But all the research that I did after the fact, because first of all, you get this diagnosis, your very first thought, my very first thought was no, right? It's denial, not me. Then the very next thought is, what about my children? And then right after that, I thought, I might die before I have a chance to live. And just the realization of it all, you know, I had finally gotten myself to a point where I had gotten past a lot of the limited beliefs and the debilitating circumstances that I had grown up in. I had elevated myself financially and taken care of my children. And, you know, I just had on the outside what looked like an amazing life. And the truth is, though, I had a lot of pain and resentment building up on the inside. And it, in my opinion, it crystallized into a tumor. So with that came a battery of tests and, and um, you know, procedures because in an instant, I went from being myself to a cancer patient. Yeah. And nobody can prepare you for that. Yeah, your identity is, is shifts or pivots in a moment. In a moment. But the beauty of that, looking back, obviously there was no beauty for me in that moment. And I want to make sure that's clear because breast cancer is not pink and fluffy and, and you know, huggy and all the stuff and, and girly and everything. That's not what it is at all. It's the opposite. I know that's what the propaganda is because somehow we've got to get through it. And I guess that's how we get through it. But I couldn't get through it that way. And so, yeah, just that that inner feeling of I am not 
immortal. And we know that intellectually, but it's those crises. And you know what I'm talking about, having that crisis where it's like, my goodness, this life is precious and I don't want to waste it. And I don't want to go through it alone. So over the course of the rest of 2019 and into 2020, I did have to have a bilateral mastectomy. So both my breasts had to be removed. And um, then I had a second surgery complicated after that. So during this time, um, my now technically ex-husband was like, hey, D, I'm going to be in your life no matter what. I'm not letting you go through this alone. So he's trying to help, but making it worse. And it just <laughs> was a big mess. Um, yeah. But on top of that, my doctors were very much um, encouraging me to go through chemo. And having been in healthcare for so long um, and understanding my body the way that I do, I didn't feel like it was the right thing for me to do. And I say that knowing it is a deeply personal um, decision. It's not something that anybody should be talked into um, or talked out of. It's, it's at the end of the day, do your own research, understand what's happening in your body and make peace with yourself, with God, with your higher power, whomever you want to call it. And know that, hey, it's okay for me to trust myself. Be willing to live with whatever decisions you make. That to me was the most empowering thing about that whole experience was recognizing I'm capable of deciding what I want and whether it works out or not the way I intended, whatever outcome, I'm okay with it and I can live with it. But here's the other big thing that happened, just like you mentioned, in that moment, boom, my identity shifted. That can happen at any time, if we decide. And that's when I realized I have the power to redirect my whole life by changing my mind about who I really am. And so if for the longest I were to see myself as this victim who was, you know, raised in poverty and and went through all of this abuse and then had all these things happen to me, if you were to just meet me on the street, you would never know that about me. Why? Because it's not relevant to who I am in this moment. But if my story will help encourage someone and inspire someone, I'm more than willing to share it. And people will ask me, how are you so comfortable just sharing these intimate details of your life? Well, because it's just a story now. It's not who I am. So if people want to judge it or people want to have, you know, whatever opinions about it they want, they get to have that. It doesn't affect me personally anymore. So it's, it's that evolution. Once you, again, face death, suddenly life doesn't seem so scary anymore. No, it doesn't, does it, right? <laughs> so it's like you shared these so, so many wonderful, wonderful tidbits and, and wisdom. And so the, like one, it's around awareness. Like, are you aware of what's happening? Like uh, within yourself, obviously, uh, we do place a lot of external focal points out there and we and obviously that creates like some wonderful stories about why all this stuff is happening to me so but it's part of your process was going inside and having some awareness of of finding your true self from the inside out that's right that's right exactly yeah and there was something really cool is what you just shared around the lightness or the freedom Mm -hmm. when you get to the point of acceptance yes and so you may not necessarily love the current situation. It could be filled with mud and muck and the dark and the dank and the pain and the suffering and all that. But to accept that is, hey, it's like this. This is right now happening. And there's a freedom to that because then you have you have a space. And in that space, you have choice. That's exactly it. And Viktor Frankl said that best, right? That's where our growth and our freedom lies between stimulus and response. I like to think of it, um, I went through this whole process of, of just trying to see life differently um, and during the, my cancer journey of understanding things just are not always what they seem. So like I live in Arizona, for instance, and, and so there are mountains all over the place. I'm in Phoenix, I'm in a valley. Everywhere I look, I see mountains. Well, it looks like the sky is sitting right on top of a mountain. And if you close your eyes, you can imagine that. But you and I both know there are tens of thousands of miles between the sky and that mountain. But that's how it looks to us. And so because it looks a certain way, we perceive it a certain way. That means we have a certain understanding about it that is completely inaccurate. But that's simply our perception. 
another thing that I started paying attention to, just little things in life. I feel like um, little tidbits are given to us all the time if we just focus. Um, I started thinking about sandcastles one day. I think I saw a picture or advertisement or something. And I thought about when you build a sandcastle. So first of all, you're usually with kids, right? And so kids, adults, or both or one or the other. Everybody's involved though. You get super excited. It's a fun day. You have all these plans. You you put all your creative energy into building this sandcastle. But you everybody goes into it knowing that sandcastle can be wiped away in a moment's notice. But it doesn't take away the excitement and the joy of making it. And to the point when the, the wave does come in, tide comes in, boom, washes it away. Now what do you do? Oh, let's build another one. Let's back up. Let's yes. make the fort deeper. Yeah. Let's make this higher. Let's make the moat this and that. And so suddenly it unlocks creativity. So what looked like it, it just decimated all the work that you did. Really what it did is help you see something you could even do bigger and better and greater and have even more fun at it. But the whole time, you know, you're not going to come back 10 years from now and see that uh, monumental sandcastle that you built. So if we can just approach life that way, it's temporary. Whatever we're going through, it just, it's just, it's going to last for a little while. You can put as much energy into it as you want. It's not going to change the fact that it's temporary. But why not go ahead and be present? You know, why not enjoy it while you're going through it? And, and even if it's a tough time, um, and I've had plenty, right? I've had times, there were nights where, speaking of resilience, um, you know, I tried to prepare my kids as best I could to recognize mom's not going to be here forever, you know? And that's a fact. That's cancer or not. Newsflash, spoiler alert, mom's going to yep. die one day, right? We all cross the finish line. We all do. And I reassured them by telling them, just so you know, mom is never going to leave this earth until you have everything you need to be successful in your life. God, God will not take me away until then. So if I die tomorrow, no, it's because you already have what it takes. And so I poured that into them. And yet I still had to give myself grace to have those moments where I broke down. There were moments where I remember this very clearly. One night I was cooking dinner and I got in some difficult news from um, one of the tests and and I was fighting back tears so hard. It's not that I don't want my kids to see me cry. It's that I don't want them to see me break completely, completely down because I, I want to have that strength for them. So I'm trying to get through dinner. I'm barely making it through dinner. And all I can think is I've got to get through this. So I can get up to the shower and just cry. And that way I'm in the shower. They can't hear me crying. That was my thought process. Now I don't have the shame of crying or the need to protect them so deeply from those feelings. I can talk to them about it because I'm no longer having to run from my feelings. And that's something that I had to learn by going through one thing after another and realizing if I stuff those feelings down or pretend like they don't exist, they're going to go somewhere. And I think you said it before, you're either going to deal with your health or you're going to deal with an illness. Is that something you say? <laughs> yeah. So either, yeah, you either, you either make time mm -hmm. for your wellness mm -hmm. or you'll be mm -hmm. forced to make time for your illness. And that's exactly and right. We, that's exactly right. You know, you were in healthcare. Uh, you know, I'm, I was in healthcare mm -hmm. and I was I mean, even this week talking to some healthcare organizations who deliver this beautiful gift of health. Mm -hmm. And they do it in such a very unhealthy way. Mm -hmm. Like the what's happening in their buildings, or I guess now on Zooms, as far as how we're treating each other, how we're leading each other, collaborating with each other, being open with each other. And the list can go on and on. I won't mm -hmm. go on and on, but you know where I'm going and the listeners know where I'm going. It's such an unhealthy way of living. Yes. It actually leads to illness. Yes within an organization that's all about providing the gift of health. It's a, a crazy irony, a paradox, whatever you want to call it. It's crazy. Yeah. It's it's nuts. There's so much there that you just shared too. It's like the whole concept of this moment too shall pass. There's another yes. Japanese saying called mano no aware. And it's really just about the transient nature of life that the, the beauty we see in life and sometimes the tough moments we see in life, which also has their own its their own its own version of their beauty. So the cherry blossoms, 
you know, I grew up, I didn't grow up, but I spent my professional life growing up professionally in DC. So the cherry blossoms would bloom and they would be spectacular. And so the concept is the cherry blossoms, we see the cherry blossoms as, as the beauty that they are, or the fall foliage, say up in Vermont, that is so beautiful, it's so breathtaking, or out in Arizona, right? So some of the things that, that blossom there too, because they don't last forever. Right? If the fall foliage lasted year round, we'd probably take it for granted. So this whole concept of like, every moment too shall pass. So I have a question for you on that. So, you know, with the women that you work with and just your life experience and all the lessons you've learned along the way, like, why don't you think we have the a greater ability to stay present? So con conceptually, again, going back to this, intellectually, we know, at least some of us know, Mm -hmm. that it's better to be present than being on our hamster wheel. Yes, yes. So we know that, mm -hmm. but then we still have difficulty being in the moment. Why Why do you think that is based on your lived experience? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. And there's a couple different ways I want to answer that because the number one reason for me, is, as far as I've experienced and that I see, is we spend too much time in the past, too much time in the future, and, and we're trying to balance it all at once. But for me, what I had to learn is I, if I do that, I'm gonna spiral out of control. I have to focus on something right now. And for me, it's my breath. And as you know, I'm working on a book right now to be released in a few yes. months called Breath by Breath. And the reason why that came to me is days like um, when I was going through my cancer journey, people would say to me, do you just take it one day at a time? It's going to be okay, just one day at a time. And that's all well-meaning. I grew up in AA with my mom and everything. And so I understand the concept. But if I woke up in the morning and it's like 6 a.m. and I'm thinking about all that I have to do during the day, all the calls to insurance companies I need to make and, and arrangements I have to set up and things to clear up. I would literally put the covers back over my head and just cry. I didn't have one day at a time. I had a breath at a time. That was all I had to give. So I had to learn to just breathe. And when I can, when I can take my full awareness and just take that deep breath, the, our breath is the only thing in our body, the only system in our body that's both fully automatic and fully under our control. And yes. by breathing, the way we breathe, as you know, it can change our state, the, the state of our body and vice versa. The state of our body changes how we breathe. So when we breathe in, we're getting ready for something. It's like, like you get that news or information or something. You hear a loud noise, you breathe in because you're preparing yourself for whatever's to come. But when you breathe out, you're telling yourself everything's going to be okay. That's your body's way of releasing that, that. Um, angst that you just pulled in from that deep breath. And so when I was learning that concept and realizing whatever's going on in my body, if I can just be aware enough to just pause and breathe, <laughs> right? And, and, and reflect on what is happening right now. Am I safe? Those are the first, that's the first question I ask myself, am I safe? And the reason that comes up is because we live in the past or the future in our mind because we're afraid. We're, yeah. we, we have regret over what didn't happen or what did happen. We don't like the outcome. We're nervous about what could happen or what might happen. God forbid, what if this, what if that? So we've got all these feelings going on, but in the moment, in this breath, everything's okay. And so that's where I have to remember. And, and even just to sometimes ask myself that question, um, am I safe? Yes. And how do I know that? Well, because fear isn't real. And here's what I mean by that. If fear were real, we'd all be afraid of the same things, right? Some of us are afraid, self-included, of snakes. I'm not a big fan. They're uh, dying about snakes. You, you do not <laughs> live in a very, a very good state if you're scared of snakes. I'm scared of snakes, exactly. And, and I have seen diamondbacks um, in my backyard. So, you know, some people, though, keep snakes as pets, as you know. Yes. So if, if the fear was real, we'd all be afraid of the same thing. We're all afraid. Uh, we're born with the fear of falling. But you and I, I'm sure both know people that skydive and they love it. 
So the fear isn't real. Danger is real though. Me getting chased by a mountain lion down the street or a coyote or something, that's real danger. And so I better be afraid and I better use that adrenaline with all I've got. But other than that, I have to ask myself, am I safe? Because whatever it is that is going on to reduce those feelings of anxiety or regret, it all comes down to fear. Um, I'm afraid of disappointment of what could happen in the future. I'm afraid of whatever impact the decision I made is going to have. And so all of that only exists in our mind. In this present moment, I'm okay. So it's it's deciding and setting that intention early on. I'm going to I'm going to be as present as possible. And then the more you pay attention to your body, the more you meditate. And I know that's a big buzzword these days and a lot of people struggle with it. I don't know how to meditate. I'm doing it wrong. I teach um, all of my clients with meditation. Look for those thoughts. Anticipate the thoughts because that's what they think. I can't turn my mind off. Good. Pay attention. See what, notice that you're thinking and now lovingly bring yourself back to the moment. It's an exercise of love and intention. Um, not to force your mind to do something that it's not going to do. The mind is not going to just stop just because you tell it to, right? Just like your heart's not going to just stop beating because you tell it to. The heart beats, the mind thinks. The point is to train our mind. And as we train our mind with our breath, breath awareness is self-awareness. Ah, I love that. Yeah. And breath breath control is self-control. Absolutely. I I love it. So it's all tied together. Yeah, no, it really, it really is. Our breath is, our breath is our superpower. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I I think we've um, put too much of a mystical sense on the whole concept of meditation. Yes, very much. I'll be a little critical. I think some people like get to the edge and really mystify it. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it in some ways for the masses so cuz that mystery does speak to a bunch of people and that's really cool like every lid can fit the pot or every pot has a lid or however the phrasing go, goes but so but for the masses for the 80% of the people walking this planet it it doesn't feel that relatable it doesn't feel all that accessible and so we're like i don't know if i can go there i do that and there's all these notions of what it is and to your point we can't stop our mind from thinking it's going to think during the practice if you will and that's normal and we just want to note that we're thinking and just have that awareness that's the beautiful thing and make make our breath which we all have it's our it's our common tool it should be the most accessible relatable thing in our body and we've tried to make it mystical where then you know people don't step into it they're like i can't do it i can't exactly it It sounds too woo woo or something to them it sounds very woo woo yeah (laughs) but the truth is it is the bridge between our conscious and subconscious mind it is that bridge because we can affect our body with our breathing or we can affect our breathing with our body And so because that connection is there, why not use it? Even if you don't understand it. Hey, let me tell you something, Michael. I have no idea how electricity really works. No clue. I just know it works. I plug stuff into the wall. I think about, you know, if, if I was born 150 years ago and suddenly transported to today and I saw... Uh, somebody take a vacuum cleaner and plug it into a wall. I'd be freaked out. I'd think this was some voodoo magic. What's going on? Because it's a wall and now there's something happening as a result. But it's because I don't have the knowledge and, and the understanding behind the power. And so that's what I try to help people see. You have all the power you need in order to live the life that you want to live. It's just fragmented right now because you don't have an understanding of it. That's not something you need to be criticized for right? A, a toddler doesn't have an, an understanding of what it means to run track. And so a toddler and pulling up on a coffee table and walking around the coffee table trying to learn how to walk, you're not going to yell at this baby because they're not in track and field tomorrow, you know? Yeah. But that's how we treat ourselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, we can be, we are harsh with ourselves. And I was speaking with a client just yesterday and she said, I'm really hard on myself. And I was like, well, what do you think would be possible if you were more loving on yourself and not so harsh on yourself, like 
what could change? So I, I love it. So I know you have mm -hmm. a program for mainly directed at women, but us dudes probably can join you. Guys so get to around, yes. you know, sort of waking up to life and, and being more acceptance, coming back to our breath. And by the way, I just can't wait to read your book. It's really <laughs> like, I am thank you. I am so excited for that book because it's it's so needed. I, to your to your point, sometimes a day seems entirely too long. We just need to get moment by moment, breath by breath. So so can you share a little bit about your program and you know and who it's geared for and what they'll experience in it? Because I it sounds very fascinating to me. Absolutely is my pleasure to share. So it really is geared for a it is geared for women, but I, I have coached men and I'll I'll give a side story real quick what's kind of cute about um, the men that I have coached because they know that I work with women particularly, but they've come to me, several men have come to me and has said, um, have said, I know what you did with my wife and she's a brand new person now. And I need you to do that for me too. Yes. <laughs> and I'm That's like, awesome. all right, if you're willing, yeah, you know, yeah. And, and I love the humility with that too, of recognizing because change is only as hard as we make it. And so just like we talked about with that pivot, boom, something changes, something happens in your life. The way I, I I get women on board with the idea, first and foremost, of how change, I'm not saying it's easy, but is it really that hard? Most women who have carried a baby, before we found out we were pregnant, maybe we drank, maybe we didn't eat the best or get the best sleep or work out or whatever. The moment you find out you're pregnant, boom, everything changes. Your whole identity shifts. And now your behavior follows suit. And so rather than it being a struggle, you're looking for ways to support this new person that you are, which is a person carrying a baby. The same thing is true if you decide I'm going to run a marathon or I'm going to do an Ironman. And, and now your behaviors start lining up with it because you have a new identity. And that's to me where it begins and ends. First, I, I take people through a process to help them see, okay, how did I get here? What are some of the beliefs that are running my life? It's hard to see that on our own. We need someone to help us draw that out. And once you see that, now you get to decide, is that who I want to be? And most of us don't ask that question of ourselves, you know, who, who am I and is this who I want to be? When I hear people referring to them, themselves as, you know, I was the chubby kid in class and, you know, I was just the class clown and it's like, okay, was is the operative word. Is yeah. that who you want to continue to be? Because now is your chance to be whomever you want. And you can have a fresh start anytime you choose. What happens though is I, I have to help people see their stories because they get so attached that they'll literally fight you. I'm sure you've experienced this. People will fight you for their story and fight you for their limitations um, to help you see all the reasons why they can't move forward in their life. And I respond to that by letting them know, I'm not here to fight you. You get to be right, but you don't get to be happy. And if you knew what to do and how to do it, you'd already have it. So yeah. can we just all lay our weapons down and recognize we could do life together and get a lot further together, right? And, and share this wisdom that we've learned together, get on board, or we can keep struggling and keeping our head above water and holding on to those stories. So once you learn how to detach from that story, that's what we do in the very beginning. We learn how to position inner harmony as our single highest goal. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to release the story. If the story was bringing us harmony, we'd already have it, right? So most of us don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I get more inner harmony in my life, right? Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. Nobody thinks that. We think about the destination. We wake up and we think, I just want to be happy. I want more money in my bank account. I want to have the love of my life. I want all these things. Um, so I relate it like this. And I talk in analogies a lot. It just tends to help. So I, you probably have noticed. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I had a client recently and I, I was trying to help her detach from her story and get her mind focused on the destination. She's a coach and she's trying to figure out how to position her offer. And she's like, well, I help people heal from trauma. Okay, nobody wakes up and says, I really want to heal from this trauma. I really want to dredge all that pain up so I can let it go. They don't do it. So I said, okay, tell me someplace in the world, across the world that you've never been that you'd like to be. And she said, Fiji. And 
I don't know how long it takes to get to Fiji. I've never been. I'd love to a go. A long time. Long time. I threw yeah. out 18 hours. I don't know if that's accurate. Yeah. We'll yeah. just go with it. And I said, how about this? How about I tell, I'm a, I'm a travel agent now. I have my travel agent hat on. Let me tell you about Fiji. And I'm telling you all the wonderful experiences you're going to have in Fiji and how beautiful it is. Only thing is, it's an 18 hour flight to get there. But then once you're there, all this is going to happen. That sounds amazing. But if I flipped it and said, hey, let me tell you about this 18 hour flight I want to take you on. And on that flight, you're going to see this and you're going to eat this awful food and you're going to have conversations <laughs> with people maybe you don't want to talk to and, and you're going to be uncomfortable trying to rest and everything. But don't worry, at the end, there's Fiji. How excited are you to get on that plane? Yeah, probably no. not so much. You might be able to get through that resistance. If exactly. If you have travel companions who are saying, get on the plane. Get on the plane. But, but yes. for yes. the most part, like to volunteer for such a trip, or, or or actually pay for such a trip. A lot of people are like, eh, I don't know. I'll read about it on the internet. Yeah, exactly. I'll watch it on YouTube or something. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, I'll like they're the not going to do it. So, so recognizing first and foremost that most of us don't really even know what's brewing underneath that that is causing us to feel the way we feel. We just know we don't feel that great. And so I work with women and men who get to that point where they say something needs to change. And when I know that they are recognizing and willing to change, now let's work together to see what do we need to do to make those changes in your life. But what I've also found is that a lot of times people, they, they want to get from point A to point B. They think it's a direct line, but it's not. And so no, in order literally. to get there, we've got to unlearn some habits. We've got to unlearn some thoughts and replace those thoughts. So my program is divided into three months. And for each month, we focus on a different subject. Month one, we focus on inner harmony, truly learning how to love ourselves and learning how to position that, letting go of the need to be right, letting go of the need for things to be different than they are. It is what it is. What are we going to do from here? developing those tools that you can use on a daily basis, not just fluff or like, you know, Alka-Seltzer when you have heart disease, that's yeah. not going to help, you know, like, um, so we focus on that in the first month. The second month, we focus on harmonious relationships because that is the biggest factor outside of the, the number one relationship with ourselves. And then the third biggest will with that is finances. And, and it's a difficult subject for a lot of people to talk about. Nobody wants to say how much they have in their bank account, even if they've got millions, they don't want you to know, like it's a yeah. touchy subject. And so we all have issues around financial harmony. So if we can blend those three and spirituality is weaved into all three, um, not in the sense of, of a religion in particular that I'm, you know, I don't push any particular religion, but just having an understanding that there is a divine flow to this life. And you don't have to understand it in order to flow with it. So um, opening up their minds to what's possible. And during that process, I work individually with them throughout the groups to help them develop a strategy to move forward in their life. And once they know who they really are, who they want to become, and then what do they want to create next? Now they don't have a default future anymore. Now they have a future they're excited about. So that's what yeah, I, love I love it. Oh, <laughs> oh, I love it. I love Thank it. You. I know many people who need it. So what's the best way, D, for people to get in contact with you? Best way is going to be to get in touch with me on Instagram. Just DM me on Instagram. It's deandra.harmony. Or you can come to Facebook. It's DeAndra Harmony Coaching. We can put all the links up for you. Um, the program itself is going to start at the end of July, and I'll be announcing those dates coming up. So, um, yeah, even just to find out about um, some of the events that are coming up, I have workshops I'm going to be doing and master classes I'll be hosting in June and July. So, um, yeah, I'm going through all this. But here's the other thing, Michael. I'm still on this breast cancer journey. I yeah. still have one more surgery to go and that's coming up in June on the 15th. And so even as I think about doing all these things, it's a living, I have to live what I teach yes. and, and this is real time happening. So um, it's exciting to be uh, in this position where I know I have so much love and support, but I'm also giving so much love and support that sustains me. It's this ebb and flow to life that I've found. So I'm excited about that. But more than anything, I'm excited to now finally be my true self. 
I know how, how liberating is that? That is so, and that's what I, you know, this work on the Kintsugi podcast and mm -hmm. the work, that, you know, I do the work that you do and so many other people do is it's really to help people wake up to their one wild and precious life to pull from Mary Oliver and really be their true self. So thank you so much for joining us on the Kintsugi podcast. I it's love it. It's been a pleasure. So, oh, and Michael, you know what, if I could share one more yeah, thing. Yeah, sure. Go for it. I have it. a quote that I want to share. It's not yeah. a well-read quote. It uh, was written by a lady named Joe Kudert back in the 1960s in a book called Advice from a Failure, which is very interesting in and of itself. But the quote shook my world. Um, she says, of all the people you will meet in a lifetime, you are the only one you will never leave or lose. To the question of life, you are the only answer. To the problems of your life, you are the only solution. If we can internalize that and take a look in the mirror and say, what do I need to do for me right now? And, and love from there, I think this whole world would be completely different. It so. would be. Yeah, I love that. That is a great <laughs> quote. I'm I'm gonna borrow it from you. I'll put it in the show notes so people can reference it. So awesome. Love you, D. Love Thanks you, Michael. Thanks for Michael. joining. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye bye. Have fun. <laughs> bye. -bye. Storm the Thanks. <laughs> hey, that's Michael. Isn't Deandra special? Oh, what a great human. I know you fell in love with her voice. I know you fell in love with her energy. You couldn't help yourself. I love what she's doing in the world. I love how she has gotten back up several times in her life. She is gritty. She is resilient. She is tenacious. And as I mentioned up front, she's a type of person that you need to have in your Peloton. I'm so grateful that she's in mine. And she's part of our Pause, Breathe, Reflect community. Again, I met her through Clubhouse. If you haven't been on Clubhouse yet, definitely recommend that you do. You can meet wonderful humans like Deandra. And then you can visit us in the Pause, Breathe, Reflect room the club. So you have some moments to hop off your hamster wheel and just connect, share space with other humans looking to be better humans to other humans and breathe and practice mindfulness, which is something that we all need to practice a little bit more of to wake up to this wonderful gift called life. So I hope you'll join us over there. Deandra referenced her book coming out, her new program. I'll put all that in the show notes so you have them. Again, I hope you liked our conversation. If you follow people on social, follow Deandra, reach out, follow up with her, put her in your Peloton. It's one way to create a better tomorrow. That I know for sure. I guarantee that. So until next week's conversation, we'll talk a little bit about my post-op experience with my knee replacement. I'll give you a bit of an update. We'll talk about resilience because that story is a resilient one. But as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing and commenting and being part of our Kintsugi community. Remember, if you have a tough moment, you can always come back to your breath. You can take a moment to pause, breathe, reflect. And until next week's conversation about resilience, I hope you have fun storming the castle. Talk to you then. Bye-bye.